What if you could save tons of time for research and setup and instead just start using an Obsidian Vault that does not look like this? Sounds good? Then I have just the thing for you. Let's go. After reading dozens of posts and comments about how to start using Obsidian, what's the best folder structure, do we really need to learn data view, and many more, I decided to try and build a free vault for all Obsidian beginners, or those who have already some experience and would like some inspiration. A few important things before we start. First, there is no single best way to use Obsidian. It's like asking, what's the best haircut? There simply is no such thing. Second, you do not need any pre-made vault, free or paid. It is absolutely and entirely fine to start with an empty one and grow it at your own pace, fitting your own needs. Third, if you do want to kickstart your Obsidian experience with a pre-made vault, then try to get one that you can reduce, adapt and extend easily. And unless you want to copy someone else's exact way of working with Obsidian, which again, probably won't fit your special needs, you will want to remain flexible. If you have no clear picture and very little experience, then start with a free vault before spending money on something that might not really be what you need. So let's keep all those things, especially the first two points in mind for the rest of the video. Whenever I show how I do certain things, this is not a dogmatic statement. If my way works for you, great. If not, then just you do you. I'm trying to show a way and help you get going. I will start with a quick overview of the vault and then explore each part in more detail. Use the chapter timestamps in the description to jump around as needed. All right, let's download the vault. The link is of course in the description. Once downloaded, we extract the zip archive. In Obsidian, we click on the vault icon, then on open. We navigate to the previously extracted folder and click Select Folder. This will open the Lean Starter Vault and we can begin exploring. If you're not the exploring type, that's also fine. Literally, the only thing you need to know to start using the Lean Starter Vault is Ctrl N. Yep, that's all you need to know. With Ctrl N, you open a dialog window where you can select what kind of node you want to create. You do not need to know what's happening in the background at this point. If you are interested in the background information and the details, then of course, you can always refer to the documentation and you can keep watching this video. I recommend taking a look at the README first page. This should open automatically. If it does not, just click on it in the left-hand navigation. Here, you can find a quick overview of all the included building blocks, including the folder structure, templates, plugins, etc. I also added a section with information to get you started, such as the playlist of my Obsidian videos and the link to my Discord server if you need any help. If Discord is not your thing, then of course you can also reach me on any of these other platforms. Next, I list all the currently available Lean vaults. There are more to come and all these vaults integrate easily with this starter vault. After that, we find a detailed list of included items. Again. I'm not saying that you will need all of those or that these are all you will ever need, but they are meant to showcase how things can be used and make it easy for you to adapt them to your own needs. I include four content maps, two dashboards, well, three if you include the homepage, and two databases built with the DB folder plugin. The folder structure is loosely based on the PARA method. Additionally, I have a folder where I keep everything that's not actual content, but needed for making things work. This folder is called 90Organize and includes file classes used with the metadata menu plugin, templates and lookup notes. Lastly, I like to have a folder for experimenting with things, which I call the lab. You can rename, remove and add folders as you wish. Just beware that you will have to update any queries or plugin settings referencing these folders accordingly. The last section on this page gives you all the specific items used in the vault. Every single template, lookup node, file class, CSS snippets, themes, custom hotkeys, and plugins. Mandatory as well as optional ones. If you don't need this page anymore, you can safely delete it. It will not affect the functionality of the vault. I often see people struggling with consolidating all the information they have in Obsidian and looking for a way to keep the most relevant information easily accessible. 
the home dashboard is an attempt to do so. I include here a quick navigation area that allows us to jump directly to notes and content maps. Here I also prepared some links that will take you to the other available lean vaults if you have them installed. If you don't have them, they link to a placeholder node. Again, you can safely delete those placeholders and links if you don't need them. The whole quick navigation section is actually a single node, which I embed wherever I need it. This allows me to make any changes in just one place and have it consistent across the whole vault. For example, I could simply add a link to the Read Me First page in this block and it will show up on all the pages where this block is embedded. Next, I prepared three sections that deal with content generation, work and private topics. Under content generation, I include queries to show me a list of new ideas, any ongoing work and what I'm currently learning. Here we also find a button that lets us quickly add a new idea. I also use some simple data view queries in the work section. We look for uncompleted tasks based on certain tags. I use these tags to differentiate between tasks I need to do and areas or topics I need to focus on. The information about focus areas comes from my daily notes. The first two areas under private are hard coded. One is a task representing my current objectives and the other just some links to notes related to upcoming vacations. The third one is based on a DataView.js query and lists all the books that I'm currently reading in yellow or I'm planning to read. Once again, we have a button here allowing us to add a new book. Clicking on the button will ask for a book title. Obsidian will then search for this book online. We can click on the result of our choice and a new book note will be created in the right folder with the predefined front matter fields and the content we want based on our template. Under Recent and Structure, I list the 10 notes I most recently updated today and earlier than today. I also have a query that lists all the content maps in the vault. The last section is more for housekeeping. It shows sync conflicts. This is a legacy check from when I used to sync my notes via OneDrive to my phone. I'm now using the native Obsidian sync and don't need it anymore, but I left it here in case other people may need it. I also added two queries looking for empty notes and missing notes respectively. For the missing notes, we get a table with a link to the missing target and a link to the node from which we are linking to that target. As mentioned, my folder structure is loosely based on PARA, Projects, Areas, Resources and Archive by Tiago Forte. If you want to know more about it, check the link in the description. However, I also add some folders that I find useful. Again, you can adapt this as you wish as long as you are aware of the affected queries and settings. The first folder in my vault is called Inbox. This is where any incoming information and quick notes land. This makes it faster to add information, which you cannot clearly connect to any existing topic just yet. I just drop it here and worry about connecting, tagging and its proper destination later. Then we have the Para block. Under Projects, I put anything that I work on and that has an endpoint. Some examples are my next trips, any content ideas, posts that I'm writing, or private activities. In areas, I have things that I keep an eye on, but that are not projects, mostly because they do not end. This could be topics like finances, personal growth, health, kids, or more work-related things like marketing or sales. The resources folder holds any and all supporting information for my projects and areas, as long as it is not obsolete. In the starter world, I prepared subfolders for recipes, book notes, people, and a wiki. Lastly, every project that has ended or other information that is obsolete goes into the archives folder. Obviously, you can create as many or as few subfolders as you like. I have four more folders in the root directory that are not related to Para. The BJ for bullet journal folder is used for my daily, weekly, and monthly notes. It's not really working like a bullet journal just yet, but I will get there. I briefly mentioned the organize folder already. This is the one folder I would strongly recommend not to delete or rename. The vault functionality depends heavily on its contents. As you can see, it includes file classes, content maps, dashboards, databases, lookups and templates. Then there is the lab, which are used for trying and testing things. Lastly, I have a folder called attachments, where any embedded files, such as pictures, get stored automatically. I configured Obsidian to create such a folder automatically on the level of nodes where the item gets embedded for example, under book notes. And that's it for the folder structure. 
Now let's see how we can do actual work in the vault. The Lean Starter Vault comes with three predefined workspaces. You can use those, remove or adapt them, or add your own. It will not break anything. You can quickly switch between workspaces by using the hotkey Alt and L to load a workspace. As you can see, there is a default one, one for Lean CRM, and one for Lean Travel. If you ever get lost and just want to get your bearings again, just load the default workspace and you will be back on the homepage with the same layout as when you started. Workspaces are a great way to use the best possible Obsidian layout for whatever it is you are working on. Need to focus and hide all the side panels? Make a focus workspace. Need to read and take notes at the same time? Make a workspace with only the navigation folder and two note windows side by side. Well, you get the idea. You can manage your workspaces by opening the command palette, usually with Ctrl and P, and typing manage workspace. Click or hit enter and you will get a pop-up where you can save the current layout as a new workspace and delete or load existing ones. Did you know that not subscribed viewers create more than 80% of the overall watch time on this channel? If you ever enjoyed my videos, please could you do me a favor and hit the subscribe button? It helps the channel more than you know. And the better it does, the more high quality content I can create for you. Thank you. I like to have fast and easy access to creating nodes of the most common types. To do so, I define a hotkey in my case, Ctrl and N, and bound it to a quick add group called new node. Inside that group, I have quick add actions for each of these node types. Sounds complicated? It's not, not really. But again, you don't need to know all these things just to use the starter world. It's really just additional information. If you want to learn how to do it, check the related link in the description. For your convenience, I included quick add actions in the lean starter world for some of the most common node types. This makes it super fast and easy to create nodes in the right place and with the correct template. Here we are back on the home page, but it does not really matter. Wherever we are in Obsidian, when we press Ctrl and N, we get a list of node types for which we can quickly create nodes. Let's start with a book node. After selecting the type, Obsidian asks us what book we are looking for. Let's look for what they don't teach. We pick the right item from the result list and a new node gets created under resources slash book notes, including the book's metadata and cover. However, sometimes this might not work perfectly if the book title or author contains characters that interfere with the file naming conventions, like here. Then we just need to remove these characters. Now we can fill in our notes and if you read the book on your Kindle, you can synchronize the Kindle highlights which will then automatically show up in these book notes too. If you don't, you can simply remove this section from the template. Quick tip here. I use a five star system for reading books, recipes, etc. To make this easier, I created templates and assigned hotkeys to them. If I wanted to read this book with three stars, for example, I would simply go into the field and press Alt and three. The same is true for one to five stars with the hotkeys Alt and one, until Alt and 5. For book notes, I also include a dedicated dashboard with various queries that you can use as they are or customize to better suit your needs. By default, I list any books I want to read, I am currently reading, or I have finished recently. If you are into writing book reviews, the second part of the dashboard will help you to keep track of which ones you still need to write and which books you rate it best. And then there's a database for your book notes built with the DB folder plugin. If you're interested in learning how to set this up, you will find the link to my step-by-step -step tutorial in the description. Next, we create a content idea node. The process is the same. We press Ctrl and N, select the node type, give it a title, and the node is created in the right place with the relevant front matter fields based on the related file class and template. As you can see, some of the properties are filled in already and the node shows up in our dashboard. Of course, we can change those values. Let's change the phase to research and the status to in progress, which will move the node to the correct column in the dashboard. The next node type is one I use rather frequently, meeting nodes. So we hit Ctrl and N, select meeting and notice a difference. For this node type, there is no default folder location. Instead, it is configured to ask us where we want to store it. I will just put it into projects. After that, we are back on familiar grounds. We enter a title. I like to use the current date as a prefix, but that's just a personal preference. 
and hit enter. Now, a few remarks regarding the meeting node template. As you can see, I tried to optimize the space by arranging the logistics, participants and agenda blocks horizontally. This is done by using callouts and the multi-column layout CSS. This makes it look nice and reduces the need for scrolling while in reading or preview mode. But it can also seem a bit confusing when we enter data. If you don't like this, you are of course free to change the template. If you are keeping person notes, and we come to those in a moment, you can link to those in the participants area. The agenda is just a numbered list. The notes section is what you would expect. I just replicate the respective agenda items using the same numbering and add my notes to each section. And then there are action items. I like to separate those that are for me from those assigned to others. Additionally, I use the tags to do and FUP for follow up. Using the tasks plugin, which of course is also in the starter board, I can then easily see those tasks grouped by their tag. Then there is the previous section. This contains a simple query that looks for all incomplete tasks in the same folder as the current node. Again, this is based on a personal preference because I store all the meeting nodes that relate to a specific project or topic in the same folder. Let me show you why this is really useful. I will create a second meeting node in the projects folder. As soon as the node is created, I see all the earlier defined tasks and don't need to go back to older meeting nodes. And I see when each action item was initially created. Additionally, I can mark them complete here and they will be updated in the original node too. Marking a task as complete in the sidebar does the same, of course. Meetings are usually attended by people, so you might want to keep track of them inside of Obsidian. For this, I prepared a person node type. As always, we hit Ctrl and N, select the type and enter a title. Quick tip here, I like to prefix person nodes with the add character. This makes it easier to search for them, especially if you have many nodes. Here, I will go with add John Doe. I hit enter and our node is created inside the people folder, as always, with properties and based on the respective template. You will notice that I use the same layout trick with callouts and multi-columns as before. Again, you can change that in the template. There is one more thing I need to highlight here. You will remember that we named the node at John Doe and that's what we see in the node title. However, the first node heading shows that name without the add character. This is done by this bit of template script inside the person template. If you don't use any special character prefix, that's totally fine. The template will still work without you having to change anything. Only if you have more than one character as a prefix, you would have to adapt the script. It is always a bit of a discussion what information about a person should be kept in the front matter and what should be an inline field instead. Here is my approach. I tend to keep properties that are not likely to change often in the front matter. This includes the person's name, what kind of relationship I have to them, their marital status, birthday and the company they are working for. In the note text, I add things like phone numbers, email addresses, etc. However, I often want to see some of the more static information stored in the front matter also in the node text, but I certainly don't want to duplicate it and need to update the information in two places. So I use the MetaBind plugin, which can read front matter values and display them in the node. The plugin can do much more, of course, but that's not in the scope of this video. If you're interested in it, let me know in the comments. At the very end of the person node, we have again a short query showing us a list of nodes that are linking to the current one. This could be related people, meeting nodes where this person attended, or anything else you like. The fastest and easiest node type is the quick node. If you create that one, you will again be asked for a title and then an empty node will be created in the inbox folder. Just jot down your thoughts and later you can process them properly. Recipes are a bit more sophisticated than that. Hit Ctrl N, enter a title and work through the template. Add values for the properties, enter your notes and you are done. For recipes, I also included two more things that might be of interest to you. First, a dedicated dashboard with some queries you might find useful, like what you are planning to cook next what you have not cooked for a while, in this case more than 30 days, most recently cooked meals and then just your best rated meals by type. Second, there is a recipes database using the DB folder plugin. This offers a very easy way to browse your recipes, update the metadata quickly and filter them in any way you want. Again, I will not go into details here regarding the 
db folder plugin. I left a link to a detailed plugin tutorial in the description for you. And the last node type I prepared for you in this starter vault is a simple wiki entry. You know how it works. Control N, select wiki, enter a title, and the node is ready for you to fill. Let me say a few words about the vault's usability, appearance, and what I use to customize it. I am using the Nup Puchin theme, but the starter vault also includes the default, minimal, and ITS themes. However, I have not done any customizations or optimizations for the letter 3. Additionally, I use various CSS snippets to create a dashboard layout, hide the properties in reading or preview mode unless I hover over them, and some other things. The links to all these snippets are in the readme node and, of course, in the online documentation. I also use the Iconize plugin to add icons to my folders. I find this easier than having emojis directly in the file name. And the choice of icons is just much greater than that of built-in emojis. To help keep my front matter as consistent as possible, I use templates, file classes, and lookup nodes. The file classes are managed by the metadata menu plugin. I also left the link to the tutorial for this plugin in the description, so you can explore it and find out how it works exactly. Whenever possible, I define lookup fields in these file classes, which get their values from dedicated lookup nodes. For example, the field book status in the file class books is based on the lookup node lookup status books in my organized folder. Sounds a bit confusing, but actually it's a very straightforward concept. You will find that I follow the same principle and structure throughout the vault, or in fact, throughout all the vaults I'm providing. If this looks complicated to you, I suggest to ignore it for the time being. Just use the vault, create your notes, and if and when you feel the need to change something, take a look at that specific thing. Do not get distracted. Of course, you're always welcome to drop a comment with questions or ask for help on my Discord server. Don't go just yet. I hope this walkthrough gives you a better idea of what this starter vault can do for you. Let me know if you have any questions, issues, or ideas. As always, I will be happy to listen and do what I can with your feedback. Now, putting this together was a lot of work, and I'm happy to share the results for free. Maybe, if you found this video even remotely helpful, perhaps drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell to make sure you won't miss the next videos. If you are going to download this free vault and you like it, I would really appreciate if you could review the product on my website. And lastly, if you could also share this information and this video with whoever might be interested, that would be great too. And again, if you need help or have any questions, the YouTube comments might not be the easiest way to interact, although I respond to them. Alternatively, you can find me on your preferred social media platform. You can find the links to all my profiles in the description down below. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time.